Object-oriented programming, a mechanism, a paradigm that completely changed the coding reality. The world of coding changed by the fact object-oriented programming was presented. So what is basically object-oriented programming or OOP as in short? So it's basically a PI, an, an acronym for encapsulation, inheritance, um, and all of these other stuff. But the basic idea of PI meaning abstraction and then P for polymorphism, I for inheritance, and E for encapsulation. Or you could write as encapsulation or whatever you feel like. So the pillars of OOP are four, and they're, these are the basic pillars that make the, the full building stand, the building of code. So before we used to deal coding in some virtual aspect that was only limited to our text screen, and we weren't considering real world examples, and we were basically doing procedural type programming. Like if I start writing code over here, so I'm basically starting with C++ and Object-oriented programming is provided in the, the basic popular programming languages like Python, Java, and C++, which are basically made for OOP. So over here, I made my skeleton. Um, you could also call it as the boilerplate code. And I would basically save this as some kind of file to like 27, 28. I used a lot. So I would say, let's say 32. All right, so over here we have this boilerplate code and what I want to talk about is that before, before even entering object-oriented programming, we used to do procedural programming. And procedural programming, uh, also known as structured programming, also known as functional programming, where we used to basically talk about function sets. And um, the concept here that applied was that when we had a a data type we used to create like for instance we had a num we'd say okay we had one data type and then we had another data type would say num1 I would say over here num so it would something like num1 and num2 and then we used to do some kind of implementation to it so we would have something like um, do you want to add do you want to subtract I would say do you want to add and then it would give some kind of value to it and I would say something like um, option so over here we would create a character and I would say option and then I would say um, the option would be either plus minus um, I would say plus I would say plus minus multiplied or divide and then what option would give it was basically if option is equal to something like plus and what would happen is something inside of this and then else if option is equal to minus would have something over here and then we would have else if um, option is equal to multiplied we have something over here and then we would have else, um, else if, we'll just say, and we'll say else if option, or we'll just say else, we'll have option is equal to um, divide, would have something in here. So this is the concept, and what was happening is that if, if you decide on what you want to operate on, so we would have something like, um, symbol so we would have something like add or subtract and it would perform the manipulation in here for instance if it was adding we would have the num and the num t one to add over here would have them to subtract over here would have them um, so I would just copy this snippet I would uh, paste it over here and we would just uh, subtract this over here I would copy this snippet I would pay, copy and paste it over here. I would um, multiply it over here. I would also copy this part over here and I would paste it over here and I could just, um, wait a minute, over here I would paste it and I would divide it using this forward slash. So this was kind of our operation procedural type which was the, uh, the top to the bottom approach or the bottom up approach which is basically where 
which was the uh, top to bottom approach where it basically the compiler reads from the top portion the include files and all of this it reads it reads it reads it reads until it sees a return zero and why do we basically even do return zeros is that we want to give a signal to the main function that our code is finished and basically our return type is int over here so it needs some kind of integer to return so if i say something like 0.0, .0 something uh should i would, would i get an error or something and I, of course i will because uh, there is problems over here but uh over here there is some uh, issues about related to that i think so it's not what am i even saying anyways so this was procedural programming that was in the beginning and it was also known as spaghetti code which was so much interdependencies we had the dependence of two or more people or things on each other and it was just cluttered so if you had more functions and more classes and more stuff to just add it would just create some kind of complexity and it would be hard to manipulate and divide so so what the object oriented brought us is some something that was easier something that is more reliable and more easy to maintain so this flexibility came and it was devised and mostly a lot of languages adopted it so this is kind of a standard which is now implemented and it makes code more easy and robust to maintain so encapsulation is basically a group related to functions and that operate onto them so like if i have this all deleted now what i'm going to talk about here is that for for instance we have a class over here and i would just call it as a base class and then i have this uh i have the body of the class and then inside my class what i would do is i would basically create a private section i would also create a public section so um i would have over here a public section and inside my public section would have some void setters or getters i would say a getter and i would say something well actually getter not but a setter so it's set something and over here we'll have some kind of value so i would say int age i would say int um i would say string name and all the other uh, random stuff what we have I, i'm not going in that detail so what we're doing over here is we have a set function and we basically set our age so i would say set age it would have some kind of input parameter inside so i would say integer temporary age and all this concept that we use to implement if you haven't watched these videos i recommend you watching all of my oop series which i've covered from the lecture number 20 of this coding cleverly series so what we have here is that we have an age and basically it's having that temporary underscore age value so we semicolon that and this is basically we're basically devising all of this into a block and this block is a, with the data members and member functions and this property was called encapsulation that we don't have to basically create robust and complex stuff by scattering everything around in the main function or putting so many functions out in the open air of global variations we just cre create some blocks and we know that this is basically only for base class if you want to inherit it you could have it inherited but it's so simple and so easy to understand so that people just devise this rule after that we have abstraction and abstraction is that kind of concept which had created a simple interface so we don't have to worry about what's going on inside the implementation so for instance if i have some kind of object over here like abstractions concept is over here like for instance if you look at a computer screen and you're on a laptop and you're basically not caring what is going on inside the computer machine how much program is done into it what the code is and even if you're using an operating system like mac os or windows or linux you don't care what code is written inside you only care what you see on the screen and the easy to user friendly implementation is done for you so that the gui is so simple and that it's just in, in an abstract way in the same analogous example i would give a driver and a car so a driver it doesn't need to know what engine and how the engine works what kind of mechanism is done into it 
The only thing he needs to know is how to drive a car. And that's how simple it gets. So over here, all you need to do in order to run a computer machine is know how to use your operating system. And that's it. So that's called abstraction. The easiness, the simple interface, reduce the impact of change. If you change something, it would not make something drastically changing the interface. So I would give an example over here is that I would have a void display function. So I would have something like display and I would give something over here and I would say, um, hello, I would about to say hello world, which is so simple, but hello there. Um, so this is basically a one line of code. It could be more than that. When you go in out there in real world examples, you'll see tens and billions and trillions lines of code, or you could see like so much code that it takes time to understand and takes time to implement. So uh, for this kind of instance, we would have some kind of code that was randomly scattering everywhere. So I would just say scattered, scattering code everywhere, and pretend that this is like probably couple lines of code and what I do here is that I don't care what's in the underlying implementation the only thing I care is that oh yeah there is a function defined that's a display and what I have to do is just I have to create an object so what I could do is basically uh, get my base class I would create an object I would create an object one and I would just instantiate the object by calling its display function and what the display function there is just gonna execute me the thing I need. I don't care about any other logic. I don't care how the hello there scattering code works. I just care about the basic implementation to it. So that is an abstraction. Then we come to inheritance. What is inheritance is basically a mechanism that allows you to reduce redundant code. And this is where code reusability plays a big role. So code reusability means that if you have a base class and you wanna create another class, but it relates to it. For instance, we have a class named animal. And now we could create, this is basically our, I would say a super class. And we want to derive some subclasses that create and inherit those properties that belong to an animal. So some specialities are limited that are not into the animal class as a whole, but there are some special specialities or specific specifications that are different from the base class itself. So we'd have a dog, we would have an, a cat, we would have something like fish. Now what would happen is that an animal as a whole will have a name, it would have an age, it would have a gender, it would have um, it would have all sorts of things. It would have so much other. It would have a breed or type. So this is the basic hat. But in dog, it would have something like, which is so totally associated to dog, like what dog food he likes. So we would say dog food and so much other. So in cat, we would have cat food or whatever cats like. And for fish, we would have the aquarium type and whatever aquarium it likes to swim in and whatever um well actually you could swim in any aquarium but you got my point the thing that what fish like what is different making them difference and what is making them unique from the others that is what specialization is and that is basically what we call inheritance so basically we need to inherit some of the properties of animal so to do that i have created a separate video of inheritance go check that out if you haven't watched it there's a top link to our card on the top right corner go click on it so you can watch the video and you could understand what the concept of inheritance deals okay so when inheritance plays a role we would have some kind of method that would say something like you would have a dog class so we would just create for instance this is a class animal and we want to inherit this class animal with so what we have is a dog and we want to inherit the properties of animal so we would say uh, we got to create an access specifier we could say privately inherited we could say publicly inherited we could also say pri protectedly inherited so there are a lot of ways to do this so we would say private uh, publicly inherited which is the most common way so i would say publicly inherited from animal so i would say dog publicly inanimate inherited from the animal and this is how the syntax works and then after that you have the the body of the class and you do all your proper 
implementation. So all of this data type and all of these attributes just copies into this. So um, what's happening behind the scenes is that all of these functionalities, all these data members are basically copying inside of this. So you could have an access to all of these and you can use them individually. And they are not supposed, you're saying you're accessing the direct name over here, but you're creating a copy, a duplicate over here, and you're not changing them as like static, static data members and static member functions. And if you haven't watched static data members and static member functions, there is also a video related to this. So you can watch that video. There's gonna be a card. So you can watch that video and check it out. But next after this is the last pillar of OOP that I haven't discussed and that's called polymorphism. Now poly is something that means many and for morphism, morph is a word that comes from forms. So many forms means like you have a lot of complexities and you want to create functionality that could be in different types of forms. So we have compile time and runtime polymorphism that it plays big huge roles in so many programming languages such as C++. So compile time is something that is in function overloading and and in runtime you would have function overriding mechanisms and these videos have already been covered in our lecture series and you could watch them immediately by going into our cards or you could check out our channel where you could see the entire playlist of C++ object oriented programming. So function overloading is basically refactoring ugly switch case statements and also function overloading will give you some that mechanism that instead of using um, return type as int, you would have a, something like an add function that would add two integers. I would say int a, I would have int b, and instead of doing this, what if I wanna do something else? Um, so this is like my signature, uh, my what you could call my declaration, and what I would do is that when I invoke the function in my main, I would have 10 and I'm just limited to integer values, but what if I want a 12.2, I wanna add something like that. That's where uh, op function overloading plays a big role. So you could have something like a float return type, you could customize it, and you could just basically name it as the same thing, but change the input parameters, make the sequence different, you could add more parameters to your thing, and basically it just creates something which is so cool and so easy to use. And that's what's awesome about function overloading. So function overriding is also another one which is um, plays a big role in inheritance and that is done with classes and all of that. So um, templates, function templates is also a part of what we could say function overloading in which we have basically a generic programming that is done and it's used a template and if and for instance, we have this covered into our video, so you could check that out as well. We would have a type name and T and all these um, mechanisms that were done in temp function templates. So that was as a whole what I would give a gist of object-oriented programming. You could create any kind of object you want in the real world, a light bulb, a student, a class. You, a class not only in terms of object-oriented programming, but a physical class where you go to school, you could have, you could have properties, of of so much things you could create a robot you could name the robot you could give functionality to the robot you could apply it to make it talk you could apply it to make it sit you could apply it to make it navigate us fall make us work or whatever you could just do anything from the top of the head what comes in your mind so that is object oriented programming in a gist um, I hope you like this video uh, do subscribe to the channel and we will see you in the next one peace out